I am so happy to be here again today with Wolfgang Smith and Richard Smith and John Verveke, doctors all, and uh, very excited for this conversation to take place. I don't intend to do a lengthy introduction of these gentlemen because I did that on the previous get together, and I'll put that into the description section of the video. So welcome, gentlemen. And uh, I, I know that you two of you have a lot of questions that you'd like to ask each other and talk over, but I thought I would start off with one question that might be a springboard to get the conversation going. And I need to give just a little bit of background on it so that the viewers will understand what I'm trying to get at here. <clears throat> I'd like to start with this question about the relationship between truth and reality or the way that truth and reality kind of interpenetrate one another as a way to explore the problem that's tearing apart our country right now, which is this relativism, um, postmodernism, I guess you might call it, some aspects of postmodernism at any, at any rate. So um, if you can imagine, and I, I found this example, but I'm not going to quote the whole thing, but a guy is walking down the street with a, another guy and, and a dog comes up on them and it's a black dog. And one guy thinks to himself, oh, what a mutt, that dog ought to go into the pound. And the other guy says, oh, that's, that's Dr. Smith's dog who lives down the street. They're coming at it from two completely different points of view because of their different um, conceptual frames. So they're seeing the world in two completely different ways. And John, you've talked before about combinatorial explosion and how many conceptual frames are possible in a person's mind and how that can prevent forward movement and it causes all kinds of problems. Up until this century, most of us agreed that there was a truth that we were shooting for, that we could see, that there was an objective reality. But in this century, we've come upon, well, I mean, this I'm, I'm still in the 20th century. <laughs> in the 20th century, we sort of came to this idea that because categories are so difficult and because there are so many different conceptual frames, there ought not to be any boundaries at all. Everything is relative, everything is possible. And I wondered if the two of you could just discuss how you think we could combat that. Given the fact that we know that there are many different conceptual frames, how do we bring ourselves back from the brink and get back to a point of being able to see an objective reality and how that lines up with truth? I may not have framed the question the way either one of you like it, but my problem is that Relativism, in some ways, has an intriguing foundation, but it's deadly. <laughs> so, well, um, maybe I can go first. Sure. Uh, if that's okay. Is that okay with you, Wolfgang? By all means, John. It's it's good to see you again. By the way, I really enjoyed our last conversation tremendously. I can say the same. So I, I mean, I do work on this because I, te I teach uh, about von Herder, who is a person who, um, at least one of the people who introduced this idea, uh, uh, at least cultural relativism. Of course, there's been kinds of relativism. You can see it um, like in Protagoras, perhaps in, um, in the Platonic period. But um, the one that's prevalent today is the one that influenced by von Herder because it tends to have come out of the social sciences. Um, and there are <clears throat> there are problems with relativism uh, because there's actually tension within uh, relativism. Um, so the idea is you have to understand you can only understand a culture, um, and of course bounding what a culture is a, is a problem. And we'll just put that aside from now. You have to under, you, you can only understand things from within a cultural framework, and your cultural framework uh, dictates how you see and experience reality. Um, and that sound, when you put those two together, most people sort of, oh, those go together. They're, they're very problematic, though, uh, because if they're both true, I would be encased within a cultural framework and I wouldn't all other cultural frameworks would be noise to me. They would be incommensurable to me. Um, and therefore, I would have no knowledge of multiple frameworks because they can only be understood from inside and they completely dictate how you see things. Where am I such that I am looking at multiple frameworks is one. And, you know, Davidson brought this 
problem up, uh, you know, the very idea of a conceptual scheme. Uh, where are you standing such that you can get the view in order to actually posit what is needed for relativism? Uh, so that's very problematic. <clears throat> and then that leads into a point I want to make. Uh, and this is a platonic point, and I've been making this with several other people. Plato's well aware of this problem, that there are multiple aspects of any object, even visually. There's multiple aspects. You don't even visually see the whole of an object. Um, and I, I want to remind people that his word that gets translated as form originally meant, didn't mean shape, it meant the look of something, it, a particular aspect of it. And so what you can do is you can say the following, you can say, there must be a through line of all these aspects because they don't strike me as incommensurable to each other. And Kant wrestled with this, and I don't think I agree with his solution. But the point is, there has to be a through line to all of the aspects. And the through line <clears throat> is not itself an aspect. It is that which binds all the aspects together. And so it is something beyond perception. It is something, well, properly platonic. Um, and I think you can see the same thing when it comes to cultural relativism. Yes, there are different cultures and different frames, as you said, Karen, but through lines are possible. I can translate between languages. I can move between cultures. I seem to have the ability to go from one culture to the other and go through a process of enculturation or take a newborn. They're not born into a particular culture. They must have some transcultural ability to learn any particular culture that they might be born into. There are lots of, there's lots of evidence for a through line underneath and that actually binds and make, gives points of mutual access between aspects and perspectives. And I think the Platonic framework actually gives us some very good ways of trying to find that through line uh, and, uh, and, and gives us a proper response um, to the inherent tension with, within relativism. So um, let me give you an analogy. I look at all the different organisms and they seem to be so varied, but you know, there's some theory, I think it's Darwinian theory, and maybe Wolfgang and I will argue about that at some point, but nevertheless, there's a through line, there's a universal process that has produced this variation. There's a through line, right? And so in a similar fashion, I think there are universal processes that produce all of these conceptual schemes all of their intelligibility, all of their mutual access to each other, all of their intertranslatability. And so we should not talk about relativism. We should talk about a proper pluralism, which is universal processes that generate individual variations that do matter, but do not matter to the extent that relativism claims. That would be my first initial pass. It seems to me that relativism is intimately connected with the Cartesian bifurcation, mm -hmm. which as we all know has been, as it were, foisted upon us in the 17th century. So ever since the so-called enlightenment, Western the educated people in the West have assumed that uh, the grass is not really green and that uh, practically everything that we are dealing with in our life is ultimately a res cogitans. And so therefore this is an invitation to relativism. I can say that my res cogitans is different from yours and just as good, of course. And so you are right in the middle of this relativistic uh, aberration, because I think it is an aberration. I think we are not true to ourselves as human beings, so long as we are relativists. And incidentally, I don't know if you'll agree with me, John, but it's, this seems to be connected with another modern problem. I remember when I came to this country as a young boy, uh, one of the first things that 
startled me and I found it very difficult to accept is the lack of respect. I came from the old Austria where respect is sort of a, uh, a completely natural thing in life. And when I came to this country, I found it was not natural and everybody uh, was uh, somehow valued his own opinions as uh, equally valid with at excuse me, with anybody else's. And so I, I do feel that one of our problems, which leads to this relativist Weltanschauung, is that we are, as it were, trained to be disrespectful. Hmm. And I think this is a very important fact that it enters the problem, whether we like it or not. Um, I want to comment on both of those things. Uh, um, the first is, I think the relativism was exacerbated uh, significantly by the uh, by the Cartesian bifurcation. I do think you think I do think you do see proposals of relativism in the pre-Cartesian world. Uh, Protagoras being one of my prim primary examples, um, but I do think it is true that the elevation of subjectivity to be half of ontology, as uh, Graham Harmon talks about it, has been very problematic uh, for us uh, um, in, in a significant way. I want to I want to zero in on the second thing you say, because I actually agree with it quite profoundly, Wolfgang. I, uh, and, and here's the reason why. And this goes to a very good article by um, by Clark in his Explorations of Metaphysics. And he talks about the special privilege that interpersonal dialogue actually has for doing metaphysics. Um, and for me, this is um, this is a way of making current, uh, I think, some of the key insights of the Platonic argument. He, he uses as an example Kant, who gives us a kind of framework that really licenses this in certain ways, although Kant has universals. Um, we don't have access to the world. And then the neo-Kantians come in and say, but those are those universals are not universal, they're culturally bound and they're historical. And then you get an argument for relativism. And, and, and um, Clark points out that Kant never actually ever gave an argument for the possibility of understanding other human beings. This is how is it that you, and this is a platonic argument, how is it that you and I communicate? And let's remember, there's two things going here. We not only have to be able to share meaning, there's a normative aspect to this, right? And we, we, we have to share both the possibility of being wrong in a way that the other person can point out. I mean, this is part of Wittgenstein's argument why there's no private language. Because if there's no private, if you had a private language, there's no way you can be right or wrong because you can't be corrected in any fashion and and it doesn't make any sense and then if you if you really seriously think that you're that right that language is is a, an illusion for you think of how much of your cognition and your science and your rationality become illusory and then if you commit to it you're committed to the fact that interpersonal dialogue is especially privileged at disclosing the fact that there are minds other than yours and they can make meaning other than your current meaning making and those two meaning makings can come into important contact and confluence. So I think your notion of respect, if you put together both communication and normativity, which I think is what is bound in respect, I think it's bang on because, right, it, like it doesn't make in like this is what I try to convey to people. If you really go down the relativism route, you have to give up, like you end up with an absolute kind of skepticism and solipsism, and you have no way of providing any kind of normative guide. Well, I'll just do what I want. Well, how do you know if what you're doing is what you want is succeeding, right? I mean, he's, 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 like, he, like there's just, or, or if you're getting it wrong, like, so I think the position that you've stated is... I think we can also get, take it back to Descartes in this fashion. With Descartes, it starts earlier, but with Descartes, you get the preponderance of 
an idea of monologic reason taking priority over dialogical reason. And I think that is also a part of this problematic that you put your, your finger on. But I, I hope you're okay with, I've tried to expand your notion of respect. And I think that this is how it um, dovetails with the point you've been making about how it contributes to relativism. So deep ideas you're proposing I do feel that respect is a kind of sine qua non for all else. Uh, in other words, we are, as a civilization, we've been, as it were, in the business of creating skeptics and creating uh, critics, creating people who uh, like to take a negative view of, of the consensus. So we've been emphasizing uh, those aspects that lead to relativism. And I think this is very dangerous and I think it's counterproductive. I think uh, in order to find truth, uh, one needs to start with certain uh, sane human attitudes and mm -hmm. certainly a part of that is respect. And I, uh, this almost universal disrespect that our culture and our schools are promoting is a very, very dangerous thing uh, because I think we're destroying something that is absolutely essential for human welfare, both in, the, in an intellectual sense of being able to arrive at truth and also in a practical sense of living our life in a harmonious way. Wolfgang, could yes. we take that idea of respect and bring it down one level and say that that starts with humility? And that that's what we're really missing? Well, I don't know, Karen, what it really starts with. Uh, for example, it, you, you might say that it starts with the child respecting his parents. And this is one of the things that I observed in modern Western education. There's less and less of that uh, as time goes on and compared to what I uh, uh, was born into, so to speak, uh, the disrespect starts right there on that fundamental level. Well, that totally makes sense then, because respect then, respect for your parents is what basically begins to teach humility as being possible. Yes. The person gets older. Yeah. I think it's very, very that, important. That what... Um... It does, <clears throat> excuse me, I think the only way to get out of this relativ relativism is to have some kind of agreed truth, right? Like we ultimately have to arrive at some set of cultural norms, and I, I hesitate to even call them cultural norms because that just makes them sound relative, right? But that is what... Uh, for example, religion and Christianity in particular um, is doing for us, right? It's giving us that set of truths that um, that if we take them as the truth, <laughs> that gives us a pathway out of this relativistic morass. And I know that's a challenging position. Um, but I think also in Platonism, there is this aspect of that there is a truth, there is an objective truth that we can be getting closer to and aspiring to. And, um, you know, one of the questions that I wanted to ask John from a follow up for our last conversation, you know, I've been through the um, modern science and the complexity science and the idea of Darwinian evolution and emergence, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and I find all of these things to be ultimately kind of 
a hand waving that doesn't really answer the question of how do we get out of this, right? How do we agree on a, a set of truths that can guide us in this, you know, non-measurable world, let's call it the subjective world. Um, I, let's not call it the subjective world. It's what everybody calls a subjective world, res cogitans, right? How do we really get past that and have a North Star that we're moving towards collectively, right? And uh, I just find the answers of, um, you know, even the cognitive science community, John, because uh, I've been there, ultimately not really an answer at all. Well, there's three or four things in that that let me respond, Richard. Uh, first of all, uh, and I want to tie it into uh, what what Karen and Wolfgang were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, we even hear, and this is Ricoeur's notion, but I'm trying to make it more prominent. You know, Nietzsche, Freud, and Marx have given us a hermeneutics of suspicion, uh, which is the idea that the moment of the disclosure of truth is to reveal the unconscious motive, the secret agenda, the power move, uh, et cetera. And when you can say, aha, see how we were being manipulated or misled, that's the hermeneutics of suspicion. Now, you should have suspicion in your, in your epistemology, in your epistemic toolkit, or you're going to be gullible. But the problem is, and this is a point made by Plato, and I think also beautifully by Marlo Ponti, and also by Gibson, <clears throat> is you can only say that is an illusion if you can simultaneously say that is real. And because this is real, that's how I know this is an illusion. The hermeneutics of suspicion is always dependent on, parasitic on, are hermeneutics of disclosure in which appearances are not distorting, when appearances are not distracting, when they are not misleading, but when they're disclosing reality. And I think that is the, by the way, that, and this is, I think, something D.C. Schindler would agree with. I think that is the proper presentation of the platonic notion of beauty. Beauty is the situation in which appearances disclose reality, and that has a priority over any hermeneutics of suspicion. And so... I would first put that in. Secondly, the relationship between parent and child is the primordial dialogical relationship. The dialogue actually precedes the child's ability to regain, to become aware of their own subjectivity. Children cannot introspect until they're about four years of age. If you ask the three and a half year old what's going on in their head, they'll say blood. We get our ability to introspect and become metacognitively aware and therefore realize subjectivity because we have internalized the perspective of other people, the perspective other people take on us. That's how we gain access to our subjectivity. So the dialogue, the dialogical, not only gives us access to reality, it instructs us on how we acquire our subjectivity. That is also why it should be given priority. And I think a dia a, a, a dialogical format that is centered on the hermeneutics of beauty is a, a, a significant answer to your question, Richard, which is, do I think the co that cognitive science per se is doing that? No, uh, any more than uh, I, I, I think it's doing a, a lot of other things that are misattributed to science. Do I think it provides us with resources for what you're talking about, which is not, I think, ultimately... Um, knowledge, but a capacity uh, that I would like to rather call wisdom, which is the ability to track, right? I mean, mm -hmm. some of the consensus of papers, that. the ability to see through illusion into reality, the ability to zero in on how what's salient and relevant tracks what is real. I think that is what we're talking about. Now, I don't know, and this is where you and I differ, and perhaps Wolfgang and I differ too, um, I, I do not see a special privilege of Christianity on this. I do see that this ability to train wisdom, and there's empirical evidence for this, does seem to find a better home within a religious framework than within a cultural framework. One of my RAs has done this work. You track people who are trying to become wiser. You have certain measures. And you see that people within religious traditions do better than those in, in secularity. But you don't find any significant difference 
in the cultivation of wisdom between the various uh, religions. Now, that's not a that's not an argument for against the truth claims of the religions. It's yeah. an argument that's orthogonal, but I think it directly addresses what you're requesting. Um, I happen to think that what we need is a dialogical reflection that simultaneously cultivates wisdom, but also discloses what is presupposed in the intelligibility of the world. And that's what I propose we need. And that's what I was just trying to do with you, with the notion of the hermeneutics of suspicion, the proper placement of beauty, the foundational role of the dialogos and the ability to track beauty as a, an answer and a response. Now, I know you'll disagree with me, but I wanted to give you a, 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 a respectfully deep answer so that you you that you have something to work with. Thank you. Um, I know Wolfgang has been working on uh, a a new paper on Platonist cosmology, and um, I think that it is part of your quest, Wolfgang, yeah. right, to try to provide that through line mm -hmm. that John was alluding to earlier right? That is this closer and closer, you know, grasping of, of um, not just an aspect, but of the whole. And uh, so Wolfgang, I would, I wonder if you have anything to say about that based on your latest work. Can I say one more thing just to, to make clear point? I think the ability to find all of the through line tells us something that Descartes denied, but the pre-Cartesians made central, which is there are many truths that are only disclosed to us when we are willing to undergo a transform transformative process. There are many things that you, as the child is to the adult, the adult is to the sage, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. so I, 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 I want to make clear that I think there is a role for spiritually maturing people in order to be able to follow the through line. That is what I am agreeing with. And wisdom right? Yes, exactly. What is wisdom? And uh, and Wolfgang particularly used a phrase, not just erudite, but wise. Yes. Right? How do we become not just erudite, but wise? John brought up something just now about how <clears throat> truths are disclosed to us when we are willing to go through a transformative process. Some truths, not all truths. Okay. But some truths. But I do think that there that this transformative process is something that for many of us only happens when we, I think Jordan Peterson used the phrase, we meet the transcendent when we err. But basically the idea of that is we meet the transcendent when we're at the end of our rope, <laughs> when, when there's nothing else left. And, uh, and that reality often discloses itself to us in consequences that are not something that we search for and yet those consequences teach us something that help us to transform help us to become more and to grow and um, I think there's something about this idea that at some point above the pinnacle of everything truth and reality become one and uh, so would you guys like to talk about that at all, about what happens in an individual human's life when they're pushing against the world, trying to make progress, and then the world kind of smacks back against them and says, no, no, you're headed the wrong direction. That is a dialogue with reality, I think. <clears throat> and it's not that different from the experience of a scientist seeking truth because a scientist is pushing against reality to try to see where the limits are and and find their path forward so that they can get closer and closer to the truth we do that all the time with our lives so it seems like a very um, basic human experience i i know it's it's wonderful when you can use this kind of language that you're using because it does help to become more precise with terminology and everything. But I also think it's good to pull it back down to the base level once in a while and think about what does it mean for an individual? Well, I'd like to make a point here, which I think is relevant. 
Namely, I think it is an absolutely vital principle that you need to have a certain access to truth before you can uh, learn truth, before you can get more truth. Mm -hmm. In other words, mm -hmm. um, not only truth, you need to believe certain things in order to advance in your knowledge of truth. And this is why I've, I find the contemporary philosophy of education, if you want to call it that, to be so deadly because uh, the young person is deprived of all truth. He's taught to doubt everything. He's taught to question everything. And uh, this is a self-defeating process because, as I said, uh, in order to find truth, you must already have some truth to work with. Uh, and uh, I find that modern education, beginning really on the level of, of kindergarten, it deprives people of all access to truth. The only thing that is presented as truth are the various slogans that are now popular in our civilization, which don't amount to anything. Uh, it's ridiculous even to, to propose whether there is truth. There's no truth in that at all. So what I'm saying is we are educating people to be skeptics. And if they were docile, they would be perfect skeptics. Happily, a normal instinct for self-survival and so on takes over, and they do believe certain things. But uh, on the whole, our education is very misplaced. Uh, instead of instructing people in certain basic truths, which they need at least to follow uh, on a contingency basis, uh, we are indoctrinating them from childhood in a kind of skepticism. This is deadly. I want to reply to both what Karen asked and what Wolf Wolfgang said. Um, I think if you pay attention to realness, you find it has this interesting tension within it. We have two different phenomenological experiences. We have one, that which is most real is that which is in, forms an intelligible coherence. This is why we say our waking life is more real than our dream life, uh, because it has a, a more expansive confirmation and coherence. And I'm breaking these words up to try and get people to take a look at their etymologies. Uh, I won't go into that in detail. But we also have the opposite. We have that right the real is what what surprises us what shocks us as you said karen what startled us and i think what we need to do is we need to and this is what drew highland argues in his interpretation of plato is we need to be able to live not just believe but live a stance in which we understand human beings as finite transcendence we are finite we are always limited we are always prone to error and that is a fundamental part of who and what we are and one of the ways reality discloses itself to us is in our finitude the way in which we things are disconfirmed falsified error uh, we realize we've misframed but we're also capable of transcendence we're also capable of overcoming self-deception. We're capable of getting a more coherent picture. I like the fact that the Greeks gave us myths, and this is one of my criticisms of Jordan. He only talks about one side of this polarity. They gave us myths of heroism so that we don't despair of our finitude. But they gave us myths of hubris, right, to remind us that we are always mortals. And so we're always held between finitude and transcendence. And I think 
to properly cultivate that is the way to actually get what you're talking about, Karen, the way we can take the right stance so we are getting the fullness of realness. And, and I think there's different sense of truths truth that go with that. I mean, you have, let me, let me, show, you've got the classic Cartesian notion that truth is what's in my head corresponds to the world. But Heidegger pointed out that depends on a deeper kind of truth, that reality can disclose itself to you and draw you beyond yourself, aletheia, right? And you need, you need a sense of truth and you need an epistemic existential stance, a way of orienting to the world that opens you up to that dynamic of realness. And so I think we need to be able to, we, we, we need, we, I, I want to agree with Wolfgang and I'll say, so, because I think he's right, but we need to be able to be self-critical or we will give in to hubris, but we need to, we need to also not give in to skepticism and say, no, we're also kelp, capable of transcendence because that is also required in order for us to be more in contact with reality um so that's why i i, I think it's very important to resituate criticism and self-criticism um within an understanding of what like what we're talking about here but to balance it off with also the capable capacity for transcendence and transformation. For me, this is why the Socratic figure is so important to me, Socrates, right? He's capable of a very profound self-criticism, knowing what he does not know. But he also knows ta erotica. He knows what to love. He knows how to be drawn beyond himself. And he Plato presents him as always trying to keep these two senses of truth and these two dimensions of realness in dialogue with each other. Well, one of the things I'm just trying to draw out a little bit here from Wolfgang <laughs> is, you know, I do think you, Wolfgang, are, you do have some concrete ideas about a kind of path towards wisdom that you've been working on. You know, that there is a direction of of coherence that you see in Platonism uh, that addresses some of the, uh, you know, things we're struggling with in a relativistic world. And I, I'm not sure that, that everybody fully understands, you know, how concrete those are. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if what I'm going to say is directly relevant to the point you just made. But it seems to me it is necessary to distinguish between two situations uh, or two levels of education. There is, first of all, a level of education for everyone. And it involves, as I said before, that the young person is uh, somehow guided into respecting certain values and uh, accepting certain basic truths, or perhaps they're not absolute truths, but something a little less than that, but truth not nonetheless. And it is already on this primary level of education that I feel our civilization has completely failed us. We're not producing the, so to speak, average man to be truly human. And this, has, this is not yet on the level of philosophy. So philosophy comes into question after people have already been educated in this first primary way, where you assume certain things that later on you may question if you happen to be philosophically oriented. But I think we need to distinguish between these two levels. Philosophy is not for everyone. 
It is for people who have a, a natural calling to that. And uh, what is true for these people is not true for everyone. And so there are two levels of education and uh, I, I must uh, register my opinion that in today's world, our civilization is failing on both levels. But the first level is really necessary for the second level. You must have a, a basically educated person uh, before you can produce a philosopher. And we are, we are producing neither. Richard, did you want to draw out a little bit more about uh, the Platonic program of, uh, because I feel uh, I want to hear that before I respond. Sure. So um, Wolfgang, one of your main ideas, not your idea, but one of the ideas that you've put forth is the idea of the tripartite cosmos. Yeah. Right. And the idea um, certainly of the Ave Eternal. And you see in Plato a path to restoring that um, presence of the Ave Eternal. And uh, you may call that philosophy. I think ultimately it's philosophers that do the work of establishing what the lower level of education <laughs> is that's going to make somebody fully human, right? Um, but I think, you know, I don't want to let this go that we can't just keep saying, well, you know, <laughs> it may not all be relative, but I can't figure out which way is the right way to go here. So let's just let everybody do their own thing, right? How do we get past that? And I think that you uniquely are, you know, have are pointing to some directions along the lines of Platonism um, and what you see in that, that really are um, something that uh, is different than what anybody else is really saying. Well, I'm glad, uh, Richard, you referred to this notion of the tripartite cosmos. I think that this is the fundamental premise, if you will, of Platonism. I would like to point out that, in fact, it goes back to the Pythagorean tradition. The more I learn about either, the more I realize that it is one and the same tradition. There's no fundamental distinction between Platonism and the philosophy or tradition of Pythagoras. It's one and the same thing. And in both traditions, the integral cosmos breaks into three well-defined ontological strata. The highest is what I call the Ave Eternal. And I think a, an appellation which is more in keeping with the actual Platonic literature would be intelligible. So this is an intelligible realm. The point is, it's a realm that can be accessed only by the highest faculty in man, which is the intellect. So here, the highest, on the highest plane, you have the ave eternal realm, which is beyond or above the conditions of space and time. There's no space, no time in the ave eternal realm. Then at the lowest level, you have the corporeal world, which is, as we all know, subject to both space and time. And then in addition, you have the intermediary world, which in my description may be characterized by being subject to time only. But I have not found that in the uh, Pythagorean Platonist literature, what I find there as a description of the intermediary realm is that it is the psychic level or also the vital. It's a realm of 
anima or soul. So you have these three, these three levels of the cosmos, and they correspond to the three basic levels of the human being. The human being is also tripartite. Uh, corpus, anima, spiritus, corresponding precisely to these three degrees of the integral cosmos. And this is a fundamental uh, ontological premise, if you will, of the Platonic philosophy. And in terms of that, you can understand what Plato has to say about any specific subject. There's always in the background this tripartite division. So, so in, oh, sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to mention that in the paper that I've just finished, I've brought to light certain what I believe to be facts, which are very little known in our world. And uh, fact number one, which I regard as very, very amazing, the uh, Platonists regarded the intermediary realm to be inherently mathematical. So their idea of mathematics and especially of geometry was that it deals with the realities of the intermediary realm. Uh, and this is a, con a conception of geometry which has completely disappeared in the Western world, uh, is completely beyond the <laughs> imagination of our mathematical communities in particular. And I regard it as crucial to an understanding of Plato. Mm -hmm. uh, these words, let no one ignorant of geometry enter here, which were reputedly written, inscribed over the portal. Uh, there's deep meaning in that. Geometry was understood by the Platonists in a way which we can no longer even conceive. And it was regarded as a key. And uh, one of the amazing things that I argue in this article that I've just finished, I, I, I claim at least that it was regarded as a theorem in Platonist days that the corporeal world, which thus represents the lowest of the three strata, is itself tripartite. In other words, the tripartite uh, division of the cosmos in its integrality is repeated on the, on the corporeal level itself. And guess what? The tripartite uh, division uh, which we associate with uh, the Ptolemaic uh, division into the sidereal world, the world of the stars, the earth at the center, Platonism is incurably geocentric, and the intermediary realm is represented on the on, on the corporeal level by the planetary sphere. So this Ptolemaic division of the integral cosmos into sidereal, planetary, and terrestrial spheres uh, is authentically Platonist. And the Platonists actually claimed to, to prove this on geometric ground. Now, I should add that uh, to the Platonist, proof was not the same thing as what we would call proof. There was no logical argument. It was all a matter of seeing with the eye of the intellect. Plato says somewhere, science is nothing but seeing. 
And they were true to that with the understanding, however, that the seeing takes place with the intellect. So on an intellectual basis, they derived this Ptolemaic tripartition geometrically from first principles. Thank you, Wolfgang. <laughs> so thank you for saying that. I'm really glad you did. And I, I really, I would just love to hear your view on that, John, as a, as a Platonist yourself, right? Like, is that all new to you? Does that make sense to you? Well, first of all, I, I'm a Neoplatonist. A Neoplatonist, uh, yeah. I, I think there's, and I, I would like to understand better what the difference is between a Platonist and a Neoplatonist. Uh, well, I mean, today what it means is uh, 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 a Platon, uh, somebody who's a Platonist and not a Neoplatonist sees a very deep discontinuity between the Platonic and the Aristotelian framework, and a Neoplatonist sees a very deep continuity between the Platonic and the Aristotelian framework, and in that sense, a deeper continuity between what you might call a philosophical spiritual program, as in Pythagoras and Plato, and a scientific program like in Aristotle. And so that's a, a, an important difference. Um, uh, and I agree with people like my colleagues, Lloyd, Lloyd, Lloyd Gerson here at Uni the University of Toronto, uh, that the continuity hypothesis is, has way more argument and evidence going for it than the discontinuity hypothesis. So that's, I, uh, is that enough of an answer right now? Uh, about what the difference is yeah yeah uh, there's a lot more of course but yeah. that, that, that that's the, the basic thing i would say in within a neoplatonic framework a lot of what wolfgang said was familiar and, and let me try and talk about where my work takes that tripart type notion so and this is influenced a lot by corban uh who was a neoplatonist who studied Su sufi persian uh, uh, philosophy, especially the Neoplatonic strands within it, uh, like Servardi and people like that. Um, so the idea is you have the intelligible, that which is only accessible uh, through the intellect. The problem when we say that is we have to change the meaning of intellect. Uh, we have made it uh, sort of a literary, almost a literary notion. When I was doing that thing of being able to find the through line that is not perceptible, but makes the perception possible, that's intellect, right? That's not riffing off theories, as Wolfgang said. That's being able to, to, to really realize that you actually never act, see all of an object. Yeah, I mean, isn't that the, the through line being? Yes. That through line, that through line, what, I didn't hear what you just said. That I, through I line used is, the word being. The being. Right, but, you have, but you have the pro, then you have the classic problem in being, which is the one and the many. How is it that every... Like, how is it that there's a through line in these, and yet they are still different, right? The, the problem of the one, and the, somehow they're both together in mm -hmm. being, but they're also different beings. And so Neoplatonism, the whole Platonic tradition, especially Neoplatonism, is really, really wrestling with that. Uh, I'll come back to that in a sec, if that's okay. Yes. So Corban is you you have that which, uh, I, that, that which can be grasped by the noose. I, I prefer the Greek because our, our current word intellect, I think, sounds just lands wrong when people hear it. Uh, like our word intellectual just connotes the uh, many, many wrong things. So I'm going to use the untranslated Greek. Right. And then you have the so and, and then you have the sensible domain. Right. And and, and I think and, and that maps onto the corporeal very. I'm talking now at the epistemic side. Right. Mm -hmm. And then what Corban brings out, and I think this is exactly right about the geometry understood by Platonism, is the imaginal, which is not the imaginary. The imaginary is the hermeneutics of suspicion. The imaginal is that images, like geometric images, can bind together the sensible and the intellectual so mm -hmm. that we can make sense. It's imagination for the sake of perception. It's, it's, an, it's an imagination for the sake of perception and intellection being able to mutually inform each other. So think about how the triangle takes you up when you think of the pure, like the, the perfect triangle, but it also takes you down 
when you're yeah. calculating like the Egyptians do in order to measure out the the, the, the base of the pyramids, right? It's doing now the so, Neoplatonic tradition said. I just ask one question, real quick. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, go so ahead. The, do you think that this noose? Yep. Is happening outside of space and time. Do I think the new? I mean, the question that sounds apprehension that 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 in that seeing that noose intelligibility is that happening outside of space and time, or is it constructed inside of space and time? Well, I'm worried about the question because it's, <laughs> and I don't mean to be insulting because it sounded oxymoronic. You said, is it happening outside of space and time, which is very problematic because I think you're equivocating between a psychological condition in which I come to a realization and then what the referent of the realization is. Those aren't the same thing, right? M my insight into this is, 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 I can tell you, it happened on Monday in my living room. I mean, right? You don't want to deny that. But the referent of that is not something that pertains to spatio-temporal locations, like E equals MC, like even uh, at the scientific level, E equals MC squared, it's not an event. I, I like where is it? I can't point to a spatio-temporal location about it. That that's the wrong way to think about it. But mm -hmm. do I think Einstein had a realization of it at the beginning of the 20th century? Of course I do. But I don't want to confuse the psychological process with the referent of the process. That's that's to get into some very dangerous territory sure, yeah that's not what i was where i was trying to get at right i didn't think so i didn't think so but so i do think to kind of the gibson question right and perception yes. the computational uh explosion and how do we ever get past that in time and space right not just faster computation something else is happening some other yes now i see what you're doing. is being yes. accessed that can't be in time and space. Uh, for me, detect, not detecting, that's exactly the wrong word. Realizing, that's the right word. Realizing the through line. Yes. Is something that has that characteristics. And I, and that is what theoria means. It's yes. to, re, it's to here's all these appearances. I, I don't do the hermeneutics of beauty. Oh, wait, all these, all these appearances have a through line that points to something beyond yes. the appearances. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I'm going to say this. I think science, this is where Berman is right. Science requires that because I think that's the fundamental place in which the, the intelligible and the sensual come together in our phenomenology. And I think the imaginal plays a very crucial role doing this, like mm -hmm. the geometry. What I was going to say is I think the Neoplatonists added to the realm of the right, of the imaginary beyond the geometrical. There were other things. Uh, there are forms of ritual behavior that can do that, can link the intelligible and the sensible together. And this is something that Corbin was interested in. I'm very interested in as well. So I agree. I would just say that that intermediary uh, domain is not just sacred geometry. There's other sacred things uh, mm -hmm. that are in that sense imaginal, that also bind the sensual to the intelligible. And I think a, an important part of wisdom is to get very clear about two things, the difference between these three and their complete interdependence. <laughs> so like you, you can't really realize a principle if it doesn't show up in some pattern, but you can't get a pattern if there isn't some progression in time for it. It's like, it's like the rhythm and the melody and the harmony they're, they're not reducible to each other, but they're always deeply interpenetrating to each other. Thank you. Did that answer your question? I liked particularly the, you know, that they're separate, but they're also, to, they're one whole, right? Because, because you don't, you don't want, well, I don't, you don't want to give in to an other otherworldliness kind yes. of Platonism, right. because the problem with that. That is it. It does so. It removes Platonism from its phenomenologic. Like being has to be both simultaneously transcendent and imminent, or it's not doing the job. Mm -hmm. It's not doing the job, to my mind. Mm -hmm. Wolfgang. So, so, John, when you when you say um, 
transcendent and immanent, you're you're also referencing the absolute and the the relative, the like relative, Schindler does, and the realizing, yes. yes, yeah, and and the intelligible and the sensible and the bond the bond they get through the imaginal. Um, all I'm all of these I think lay on each other in an important way. I like and that. I and I think it's very I think one of the things that I'm excited about and it's coming through is that there's a current movement to reintegrate phenomenology and Platonism together so we get the continuity and we don't just like uh, like I think one of the things that put Platonism into sort of a, 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 a almost obsolescence is that we removed it too much from the project of wisdom cultivation. And that goes back to the point that Wolfgang was making about respect. If all of this platonic metaphysics doesn't translate into me becoming wiser, mm -hmm. there's something fundamentally wrong to it. And I think that is a Socratic platonic claim that I just made. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't translate into the cultivation of wisdom in the guts of my being, in the, in the minutia of my life, then it should be rejected. Mm -hmm. Wow. Let me just make a comment relating to what you just said, John. I have in my library rather rare treatise by Proclus mm. on the nature of Euclid's geometry yes. and uh, what uh, Proclus uh, enables us to understand is that First of all, uh, this geometric tradition is not native to Greece, but it originated in Egypt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And secondly, and more importantly, uh, the tradition of geometry as understood by Platonists was actually related to a tradition of, well, what shall I call it, a kind of monasticism, mm -hmm. in other words, uh, leading, quote, unquote, geometrists were actually in those days living a life, a monastic life of, you might call it meditation. Uh, of course, it was a very specific kind of meditation. Uh, connected to geometry, mm -hmm. but it was a meditation nonetheless. So what I'm saying is that uh, this platonic tradition in which geometry uh, plays such a central role actually has something yogic about it. It was very much related to the problem of ascending to higher states of being, and eventually uh, finding our way somehow into the eternal realm. I, I totally agree with that. And and Proclus, of course, is one of the people. He's post iamblichus so he's talking about theurgia, and and geometry is part of all of the theurgy. And of course, the theurgia gets taken up by Dionysus and enters into Christian liturgy. Um, and that's what I meant by, in addition to the geometrical, we should be talking about the liturgical within yeah. the um, Because there's kinds of knowing that are, are not, you know, that are more touched by the liturgical and others uh, by the geometrical. Um, I, I, I told, uh, first of all, I envy you, you having that, that, uh, that's, so just, just a base moment of desire. I would really like to have that document. Uh, uh yeah, but, uh, yeah, Proclus, um, is very, very, uh, a very pivotal figure. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm very much, um, intrigued by how we can, and, and how we can bring back, um, I, uh, I want to get. I'm sorry. This is not meant to be any criticism. Of what we're doing here. In fact, I think the di the dialogos is actually pointing beyond the just talking about it. We're trying. We need to get back to a a a a, a, a uh, like a, a a participatory and perspectival and transformative engagement with the imaginal. Because I I do think that without the imaginal, we and you may not agree with me on this, Wolfie, but I think without the imaginal, we can't properly relate the intelligible and the sensible. 
but maybe you are saying that about the geometrical and the liturgical. I think they have an important place. Um, so the later Neoplatonists, like Proclus, in fact, were very keen to argue that without the imaginal, we can't get access to the transcendent aspects of the intelligible. And that was a di that's a difference they had with Plotinus. Um, and so they put much more emphasis on this intermediary domain. I wonder what you think about that. I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I couldn't agree more because actually uh, the, uh, the geometric realm is the intermediary which means that it combines the uh, uh, purely intellective with the imaginal, as you say. Yeah. It's both there, and yes. this is essential. And this is why geometry was so treasured by the Platonists and the Pythagoreans, because uh, it is the... Uh, intermediary the link between the two extremes exactly, exactly it's a key to wisdom i have seriously considered taking up sacred geometry as a practice i've got some books on it and uh because for me that notion that like the, the way they did geometry right, right bridges between the perspectival and the propositional etc the very first mystical experience i had in my life um I was reading the Republic and I was just in like first year university. And the very first I've been doing meditation and other things was of the forms and the geom geometry, the, the imaginal apprehension of geometry was the medium through which I had this experience. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. I found that I found that deeply pivotal and, and exemplary of what we're talking about. What I want to know is if, if there's good reason to believe that generalizes, and it sounds like there is, other people that we should find that an, indis in, an indispensable thing for other people. And then how do we afford it for other people? How do we afford it for other people? So so I'd, I'd kind of like to jump in here, John and Wolfgang and Richard, um, with the ideas of Esther Meek. I know that you've talked to yes. her, John. I've talked yes. to her a couple of times. And reading her books. <laughs> and... Um, she also references D.C. Schindler a lot. Yes. And she has, uh, and she got her ideas by deeply contemplating the work of Michael Polanyi. Mm -hmm. And so she talks about this contact with reality. You've mentioned that phrase several times. And to me, when I hear her talking about that, it is very reminiscent to me of Ian McGilchrist's concept of the right hemisphere of the brain being the only one that has contact with the outside of the outside. The right hemisphere is the exploratory open hemisphere, and it brings in the, the part that it's willing to receive, and then it hands that over to the left hemisphere, and the left hemisphere starts processing. But when she talks about contact with reality, she'll use an ex a simple real life example, like um, I want to learn how to trim a rose bush. In order to do that, I have to develop a relationship with that rose bush. I have to learn to love that rose bush enough to where I want to serve it. I want to understand it deeply so I know exactly where to trim it without injuring it, how to feed it so that it's going to flourish and thrive. And that is a procedural thing. And you, you build in this procedural knowledge. Um, same with learning how to ride a bicycle or learning how to play the piano. And so in some way, all of these, or learning how to paint. I mean, for me, it was learning how to paint. These procedures are in a way very liturgical because when, as you've said before, John, when you're doing something like that, you can very easily get into a flow state. Mm -hmm. And that flow state is what allows you to kind of have access to this, the access to the noose, to have that contact with reality that um, takes you outside of yourself, let's say. And so I wonder what you think about that connection between liturgy and ritual. I mean, liturgy and the procedural way of knowing. 
Well, uh, there's a there's you've said a lot there, Karen, and I want to respond to each one of the important moves. Um, let's start first with Meek and Polanyi, and I think she's right that Polanyi's notion, um, and uh, this is something where Esther and I converged, is that the contact with the reality is the contact of so of something that's inexhaustible, um, yeah. and that's right the disclosure, and that's the aletheic notion that combines both. The intelligent, so there's the intelligible shining in and the perpetually mysterious withdrawal. And that is the proper, and that is again the finite transcendence. That is the stance you should take with, to if you are in love with somebody, right? Uh, they, they, they're they not chaotic to me, they're, they're, they're intelligible. I'm, I'm deeply knowing them, but my knowing is always being drawn beyond because they are inexhaustible to me. And, 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 and so I have to, and I think the flow state is. When you're coupled to the through line that is capturing uh, and you're being captured by that inexhaustibleness of reality because in the flow state this is one of its defining phenomenological features there's the there's the ongoing sense of deep discovery and super salience like there's insight after insight after insight but it's it's all just flowing together and so i agree with that now about the left and right hemispheres i mean there's a lot of convergence between ian's work and mine and if you want to see that, uh, Kurt, uh, I was on uh, Theory of uh, uh, Everything with Kurt and with Ian, and you can see that convergence. However, I I, I resist, <laughs> is that the right word? I resist the idea that the right hemisphere is the privileged access. Well, so to, do I, so do I. <laughs> and here's, here's there's- I, I resist mean, the, the right idea that the right hemisphere is dominant or should be dominant. That's what I resist. I, the right hemisphere should be dominant in so far as the right hemisphere is about problem formulation and the left hemisphere is about problem solving. And problem formulation is more important than problem solving. But it doesn't mean you solve your problems with just problem formulation, right? That is, mm -hmm. uh, that's where I disagree, I think, with Ian, right? And, and you have to remember that the right hemisphere is also the hemisphere that's overactive when you're depressed. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's, that's, when this gets overactive, I get depressed and I get well, severed from reality. Well, so I know that I know that this is going to get me in a lot of trouble. But to me, <laughs> to me, the right hemisphere, when I read his books, the right hemisphere is very convergent with, um, to some extent, the feminine archetype and the left hemisphere, very convergent with the masculine archetype. And it seems to me that when the two are working together properly, they're working together like a marriage. That's the argument I've made to Ian. That insight. Really? Oh, that, yes. And somebody made it. <laughs> well, I did it in terms of insight. Insight is not a property of the left or the right hemisphere. What you see in insight is activities predominantly in the left. It shifts radically to the right, and then it shifts back to the left. Insight is in the dialogue between the left and the right hemisphere. Yeah. That's where it shows up. It's not a property of this or of this. So that's. That's where I would agree with you. Now, um, I like I don't want to argue too much about Ian in his absence, but mm -hmm. I, that's how I would wa I, I want to respond. And so I think that um, that ability. Well, the only reason I brought that up is because okay, I think ahead. that I think that idea of marriage is a fundamental it's in, it's, it's, of the it's, universe. It's, well, it's in Esther's notion of a covenant epistemology. That's how I was yeah. going to bring it back. Right. And, and and notice that a covenant epistemology is properly a dialogical epistemology, a dialogical metaphysics. And this is a notion that is very key in Neoplatonism. And it, it's going to be in my series after Socrates. And we're going to release it December the 2nd because we got 19 episodes filmed now and we're ready to go. That was a shameless plug. OK. And the idea is that, and this goes back to something I think Wolfgang was putting his finger on. The dialogue within and the dialogue without and the and the horizontal dialogue and the vertical dialogue, this is a, a strong claim in Neoplatonism, all have to be properly in sync together. And part of what it is to educate for wisdom is to get all of those properly in sync together. So I find it very interesting that we do agree that there is something in this, even let's call it yogic tradition of uh the imaginal or geometric um explorations right that there's something there to be revisited 
and you know and and yeah john i really appreciate your point too that like if it just becomes this kind of abstract thing that doesn't really mm -hmm. embrace the whole um then it's failed right it's integrality it needs to be integral it's not yes. just about getting to the ave eternal and leaving the corporeal <laughs> right um which by the way, uh, actually one of the things we did get into with Jonathan was some of the metaphysics of Christianity, which I think you would find very interesting. I'm sure I would. Jonathan and I have an ongoing, and what happened at, in Thunder Bay between the two of us was truly astonishing. I just want to say that the that the parable, and I think that's the correct name of it, not the allegory, the mm -hmm. parable of the cave, you don't just ascend, you return. Yeah. yeah. Right, they are equally important, and DC Schindler makes a very good case about that. Um, and and I, because we need to think about this, because we, we yes, we are suffering. Wolfgang's right; we're suffering an epidemic of skepticism and nihilism. I don't deny that, and narcissism, and they're all Which is wrapped coming up from just being exclusively taking the horizontal as real. Right, right. but I want to say and the opposite. Denying the vertical. But you can have people who just do the vertical. We yes, have also absolutely. a growing epidemic of spiritual bypassing. Which, you know, there we well, have the cross, right? Well, Speaking right, of Christian yes. metaphysics. Yes. You so, have the horizontal and the vertical, and they're united. Yes. Um, I, I don't know what you want me to do about that. I mean, I just wanted to make the point that both reductions... Yes are showing up. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think yeah. the bifurcation in Cartesian metaphysics drives people to either one of these. They go into flatland or they go into spiritual bypassing. Yes. And I think that we should talk about both problems together if we want to actually come up with a more comprehensive response. Thank you. And I, I just, oh, I, I would, I would like, like to ask. I would like question. to get back for a moment to the point you made a few minutes ago when you were speaking about that spiritual experience involving geometry, uh, yes. I, I feel very strongly that this was an authentic example of the spirituality which was unquestionably uh, associated with both the Pythagorean and the Platonist traditions. Mm. Uh, they were therefore, in a sense, sacred traditions. And this is also what explains the fact that the Platonic literature is very difficult to access. Yes. Because it was not meant to be accessed by just anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, everything pertaining to the yogic or spiritual side of our life was in ancient times uh, uh, regarded as uh, something that needed to be protected from, from vulgar access. And so uh, this is why uh, the Platonic dialogues uh, are very difficult to access from the outsider. And let me mention in this connection, perhaps this may interest you, I have found a Platonist of the 18th century to be, to my understanding at least, unique in his penetration of Platonism. And I'm referring to Thomas Taylor, uh, and I'm very fortunate. I have a lot of his translations. I have five volumes of Plato translated by Thomas Taylor, and I have Jan Blikos and Proclus and Plotinus and many other Neoplatonists also translated by Thomas Taylor. And his commentaries, I'm referring to Thomas Taylor, his commentaries have been of immense help to me in as actually breaking into, hopefully, the spirit of Platonism. So I think 
I think that's an excellent recommendation. <laughs> um, thank you for saying that. That was um, that that experience was probably authentic. It's been a, it was a pivotal experience for me. It launched me into an entire pathway. I sometimes trespassed from that pathway, but I think I have found myself uh, back in it, and I've been living it. I think very deeply now for at least the past decade. Uh, but it means a lot for you to say that, Wolfgang. So I just wanted to break out of the dialogue for a second and say thank you. Um, that was uh, personally helpful to me. Uh, to it, it has all the earmarks of what I have learned in rather recent days, in fact, based upon the commentary on the Timaeus by Thomas Taylor. Mm -hmm. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm dumbfounded. Thank you. Thank you. It interests me, especially because I've just finished this rather major article on the Platonist cosmology, and uh, there are many aspects to it. And let me just mention very briefly that. Uh, it throws entirely new light on cosmology mm -hmm. because uh, it shows that our cosmos, and I'm referring now to just the corporeal cosmos, that's the cosmos that the astronomer is interested in, the, the corporeal cosmos contains a macrostructure which is uh, an irreducible wholeness. So it, it, is, it comes from the eternal through vertical causation. Mm -hmm. And as such, it is completely incomprehensible and inaccessible to our sum of parts sciences from physics to astronomy. So mm -hmm. this is a macro, a macro structure of the astronomical cosmos coming from the eternal realm, uh, which uh, our scientists cannot access. They cannot even conceive of such a thing because our sciences are based upon sums of parts. The only wholeness that they can comprehend is a sum of parts. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the defining characteristic, if you will, of, the, uh, of these higher wholenesses is that they are irreducible. They are therefore geometric in a Platonist sense. Well, we already talked about that last time, that, and I think there's something deeply right about that. Um, and uh, I, I think, well, I argued, and this is also prevalent, especially in the dialogical Neoplatonists like Eregina and Kuza, that the bottom up and the top down are equally needed in order to understand realness, and they completely interpenetrate. Um, <clears throat> and so um, that means there's an inexhaustible, there's not only an inexhaustible through line sort of this way, there's an inexhaustible this way. And to bring it yes. back to you, Karen, I think we we have to, and I think Esther is pointing towards this, but I think the notion of the contact as the ongoing transformative conformity to the inexhaustible is not only horizontal, but vertical. Um, um, and and um, I think that, that again, when you get traditions that train people in the two, di the two directions and their integration, you, you get people who have, I think, well, what I would like to eventually do as a scientist is, you know, measures of cognitive flexibility, capacity to enter into the flow state, uh, ability to self-correct. Uh, because I do think that these contemplative practices and the meditative practices and the liturgical practices and the imaginal practices do have profound real consequences in people's everyday cognition. Mm -hmm. um, if it, like, again, if this, you need to have proper reverence 
for that. But you, I think it is also proper to demand or to seek to see how that plays out in how well you're interacting with your kids or how well you're treating your, your, your romantic partner or how well you are pursuing your career. And, and well doesn't just mean success. It means, are you doing it virtuously? The, the Buddhist notion of right livelihood. For me, it always has to come back into that. And all of that should always be drawn into further education by the upward reverence. So for me, the reverence and and, and the, the and, and and the virtue have to like they have to be completely mutually supporting. I'm gesturing wildly, which can tell you I'm getting very passionately involved in this. So I should try to calm down a little bit. But but uh... it's beautiful. Thank you. I, I did want to just ask you briefly, John, if you have a uh, what you would recommend as a book that sort of or a resource that gets into the what you call the neoplatonist view right as kind of the lacking the discontinuity the aristotelianism opening up to other kinds of you know um imaginal forms is there anything i don't know if there's book? a single book i think the the book that for me does the best at as an initial thing is Theophany by Eric Pearl, which is his book on Dionysus. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I think that that's an excellent book. I recommend um, Clark's book, Expl Explorations in Metaphysics, because, uh, where that essay on the dialogical, I think is absolutely central. Uh, and he's, of course, a Christian Neoplatonist. He's a Thomistic Christian Neoplatonist. And I do I do agree with the arguments of Morello and Clark and others that Thomas should be better under Aquinas should be better understood as a Neoplatonist Good. than as a Neoplatonist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that's deeply right. Um and so though the um that would be a, a, a couple of good places to start. Thank you. Um Thank you. I'm trying to think of something that's a little bit I'm trying to think of anything that I mean. I mean, the 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 place to go for the imaginal within Neoplatonism is Corban, but Corban. I wouldn't recommend starting with Corban. Corban is not an easy easy text to read. Uh, you might want to read some stuff about Corban, uh, and that's where I would recommend the work of Thomas Cheatham, "World Turned Inside Out," um, "Imaginal Love," "All the World Is an Icon." That I would recommend um, his work. Uh, because I think it's it's better articulated and explained uh, than Corbin's own self presentation of the material. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, well, we're probably at a pretty good stopping point anyway, since we've been going for an hour and a half. Um, is there anything anybody'd like to say to kind of wrap up, or last words, or? Um... I'm very, I've really enjoyed it a lot. It's been very encouraging to me that I feel some direction towards like probing towards new opportunities to ultimately approach wisdom, mm -hmm. right? And I feel like we've identified some concrete things that point in a direction of things we can do that ultimately um, will lead to wisdom. And I'm really searching for that, not just for myself, but for our culture um, at large. And uh, so I really appreciate everybody's contributions. Seems Thank to you, me as a minimum, we should go back to Platonism in the schools, right? <clears throat> I mean, that's something that hasn't been taught in the schools for forever. <laughs> and it is something that in a way is not as controversial as a religion, right? Let me just add to Karen's remark. Nothing would please me more, but the problem is that before we can teach Platonism in our schools, we have to completely restructure, revamp our educational system yes. because as I mentioned at the very beginning of today's uh, conference that 
our education system is so uh, structured today that instead of educating the young people to be receptive to wisdom, and we are doing just the opposite. We are, as it were, blocking their way, uh, condemning them to an intellectual mediocrity, to put it charitably. Um, I really uh, caught on fire, um, and Wolfgang has now consistently had that effect on me. <laughs> and, but I also want to thank uh, Karen and Richard for how they scaffolded that and uh, kept it going, uh, stoking the fire when appropriate, um, sitting back when it was appropriate. I recognize that, and I appreciate it. I'm grateful for it. Um, I think a a properly revised Platonism can give us what I was arguing for earlier, which is a proper pluralism. Platonism is a through line that can run through religions. It can enter into reciprocal reconstruction with Christianity, with Islam, with Judaism. If you pay attention to the Kyoto School and other people with Hinduism, at least Vedanta, um, it doesn't mean it's identical. I said reciprocal reconstruction, but allows people to get into deep dialogue um, also with Buddhism. And so I think um, it doesn't have to be some kind of exclusivistic uh, education that we're talking about here. It could be a properly pluralistic one in a profound way without it falling into any kind of simplistic relativism either. Um, so I, I'm... I'm very excited about the prospect of more and more people converging around this um, in, in a powerful way. So uh, I found our discussion, and especially when Wolfgang made a, a particular and appropriate personal remark, I found it very encouraging, uh, very encouraging. So thank you very much. Well, and John, I want to thank you for all your work on the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis series, because I think that is establishing a foundation of people who might be able to teach other people some of these things because before you can change the educational system you have to have some resources available which means you have to have some people already on the ground that have um internalized some of these truths so well wait till see after socrates because it's much more explicitly about developing this proposal great and I want to thank uh, Wolfgang for all your many books. Every day I read something from one of your books, Wolfgang, and every day is a treasure. So I appreciate that much. And thank you, Richard, for all your work in putting this together. And so I, just, I want to a... just add to John's comment. I spent a few days with Wolfgang a couple of weeks ago. I went out to California and I, I really hadn't seen how deeply his work is about Platonism, you know, and you're right that that is the common thread that all of the religious, um, you know, there's tremendous work in Wolfgang, interest in Wolfgang's work from uh, Islamic scholars and um, Buddhists. He's often, you know, associated with the perennialists. But I think that it's actually the Platonism that is shining through and is the common cause and the common thread that's resonating with you know, many different groups. So I, I agree with Arthur Perkins. That's the only sense of perennialism that makes any sense. Yeah. The perennialism was about really about Platonism and Neoplatonism. Mm -hmm. But that's another conversation. Yeah. Well, I'd be up for it, but not for a couple of months because I'm <laughs> having surgery next week. So good luck with that. Thank you. So Thank you me. guys have a wonderful weekend and uh I'll see you maybe in December or January. Thank you. Thank you, well, thank you Karen, for another beautiful meeting. I enjoyed it very much. It's always a pleasure to speak with you, John. Likewise. A great pleasure. Likewise. Bye bye.